Rashid for his vast information. And we've learned a lot. You know, as I look at some of the other tour guides, and a lot of them are a lot younger, and there's, that's, that's great, that's wonderful. But that man is so filled with so much knowledge, and we are the recipients of what he has given us. And so really, right now, can we just give Rasid a real round of applause and thank you. I'm leaving here feeling like a student. Uh, I've been teaching, particularly Ephesus, I've been teaching church history for about 20 years. And sitting under this man, I really feel like I'm a novice. I've only begun. And so I'm really grateful for all of the information that he has supplied us with. And I hope we can take all of that home with us as we glean and as we meditate on what has this trip done for us. If I can add, just add maybe just a couple of little things, uh, if I could uh, just say that slavery, Ephes uh, Ephesus was the capital for slavery in this whole part of the world. People would come across the mountains and they would come from the sea to buy and sell their slaves. And so when you read about the Apostle Paul talking about slaves and the behaviors that slaves should deal with, if you can understand that this is a slave capital, you can understand why so many slaves became believers and they needed to know how they are to treat their master and respond to the behavior of them. Um, I'm going to say just very, very little about Ephesus. In fact, um, I really want to concentrate. Oh, one more thing I will say. Silversmithing. Uh, uh, Rashid did touch on that, where silversmithing was huge, huge business here in Ephesus. And as you have seen the little models of Artemis or Diana, uh, what the silversmiths did is they made these little idols. And they would make them for the ones, the people who would come across on the sea. They would put them in, like we would call it our backpack. They would take it with them. If they came across the land, they would also take these little figurines with them. They would plant uh, um, idols of Artemis in their garden. And you found her just all over the city. So when the Apostle Paul came, to preach the gospel, this really hindered the silversmithing business. And so they got to a point, they did not like the Apostle Paul, and they wanted him run out of the city. So um, um, this was huge, huge business here in Ephesus. But I want to concentrate on why did the Apostle Paul write to the Ephesian church? Why did he do it? Now, when you think about it, when I talked about how in the Hall of Tyrannus this morning and how new believers would come to learn how to behave as Christians, how to act, and uh, just all about their faith, uh, what they got is word of mouth. They didn't have anything written. And so about the time that the Apostle Paul was writing to the Ephesians, there was something else going on. There was a cultic belief that was going on in Ephesus called docetism. Now, docetism is the earliest form of Gnosticism. And if I can just give you just a little bit of synopsis on what is Gnosticism, it basically means knowledge. But Gnosticism uh, pretty much said that they did not believe that Jesus came in the physical being. He came as a spirit. And so for those who think they saw him in the physical, they actually, they say, they saw him in the spirit. And so Jesus was never in the physical body. Well, when you think about that, what does that mean as far as Christianity? If Jesus didn't come in the body, then he could not shed his blood on the cross of Calvary. If he did not shed his blood on the cross of Calvary, then he 
did not go to hell and God raised him from the dead. What does that uh, do for Christianity? It totally wipes Christianity out. And so, and like I said, the earliest form of Gnosticism was starting about the time that the Apostle Paul wrote the, to the Ephesians. And so when he wrote the six chapters of what we know as the book of Ephesians, you take the first three chapters and they are on who we are in Christ, everything that we have because of Christ. And then you get to chapters four and five, it teaches us how to live, how children are to behave with their parents, how parents are supposed to treat their children, how families, husbands and wives are supposed to interact. And then we get to the sixth chapter of Ephesians, we know that it talks about the armor of Christ. How can we stand strong in our faith? Well, when, um, when the Apostle John, now this is 30 years later, the Apostle John now is about to leave this earth and he, he can see these little shreds of Docetism, which is growing into Gnosticism. And Gnosticism, by the way, by, between the years of 120 and 140, were bigger than even Christianity. And so uh, they had to be stopped. But um, when the Apostle John came to write his last three letters, we know that he wrote the the book of revelation as well as the gospel of john but he wrote three little books first second and third john and if you look at those books he called his believers my little children and he knew that this cult was starting to overtake the church and remember jesus said to the apostle john i know your works and he said that he commended the church that that they were trying to protect evil from coming in into the church but he said this I have against you remember your first love well what I want to read in just kind of finishing everything up here is first John chapter 4 and this is what John is warning the believers um, uh, in not only Ephesus but this whole life was valley here and this is how you can tell uh, that Jesus is who he is. In other words, refute Gnosticism. Where Jesus says in 1 John chapter 4, starting in verse 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have, have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. Now this refutes Gnosticism. That Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. This goes all the way back to the late first century that the church needed to be protected. Is it any different today? We have hundreds and hundreds of denominational churches uh, in the world, of Christian churches. And each one of the, uh, of the different denominations has a little bend here and there. But just take a look at this group here. We are a variety of denominations, but we have a common bond. And our common bond is what Jesus Christ has done for us. And as I have taught my students for years, I point out the five points of Christianity. This is what it means to be a Christian. First of all, you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and He is God. And that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. 
and that God rose Jesus from the dead. And Jesus right now is up in heaven, and he's interceding for his body. And then the last one is that Jesus Christ is coming to gather his saints, his believers, his body all unto himself so that we can spend eternity with him. That All of that is encapsulated in the Apostles' Creed, which was brought out the other day. But the important thing is, you know, there is cultic activity that tries to come into the church. Today we have a lot of cultic activity. And so what I want to leave you with is remember these five points of Christianity. And again, it's wrapped up in the Apostles' Creed. And if you want to know if something is a cult, if you add or you take away from any one of those five points, you are not dealing with true Christianity. And so just as in the first century, as it is today, Christianity needs to be protected if we're going to be uh, faithful to Christ and to have Christianity the way that God originally set it up, the way that Jesus preached. Amen. Amen.